Today we're talking about one of the worst details that we commonly see on a lot of projects for both new and existing buildings, and that's locating your floor framing below grade, especially when it's adjacent to a concrete porch or patio. We see tons of rot and moisture issues whenever we're locating framing below grade, and especially if it's improperly flashed and poorly drained. Whether you're a design professional, a builder, or a contractor, you need to make sure that you're avoiding this condition whenever possible to reduce your risk and to make sure that you're designing and building durable homes that will last many generations. Now, one of the biggest reasons why we see floor framing being located partially below grade is usually because the designer or the builder wants to provide a smoother transition between a porch and the main floor or to provide a flush transition between the indoor and outdoor space, typically accomplished by pouring a porch slab directly against the framed wall on floor and this is exactly where we tend to see a lot of rim joist rot, as well as even some basement leaks if the porch or patio is poorly drained. This is primarily a design issue, especially if we see this practice in new construction. So why exactly do we see rim joist rot at this location? Well, there's a couple things going on here. If we have a concrete slab being poured directly against the framing, even if it's separated by a WRB material, that concrete is going to bond to that WRB or weather barrier, especially if it's a synthetic polymer like most weather barriers these days. And when it bonds to that membrane, we get a complete loss of repellency, and that moisture can wick through into the sheathing and into the rim joist behind it, essentially soaking it in water. Remember that concrete has a lot of water in it, and that water is going to want to move towards the drier side of the building assembly if it's in contact with it. Same thing with vapor, it's going to be driven inside if there's a higher concentration on the outside. Moisture moves from higher concentrations to lower concentrations and from warm to cold. We also have to deal with the fact that even after the concrete dries, it's going to wick water from the adjacent soils if they're wet and distribute that moisture inwards. Concrete is extremely porous and can wick water shockingly far distances. Now some builders understand this and they'll install a secondary impermeable self-adhering membrane, usually made of rubberized asphalt, not only to act as a bond break material, but to provide a second line of defense against capillary wicking. However, this impermeable membrane doesn't stop the buildup of hydrostatic pressure, and hydrostatic pressure is the weight of water exerted onto a surface that can drive its way through any imperfections in the waterproofing, any fish mouths in the membrane or poorly flashed transitions, and it makes its way inside. Here in this example, you can see that this is exactly what happened in this case. There was a secondary impermeable membrane installed between the patio and the framing, and water still got inside through the joint between the mud sill and the concrete foundation wall. The patio was sloped, but not adequately enough, and during construction you can see water just leaking inside. There was also a small overhang without any gutters that was draining water right over the wall and saturating this location, and the buildup of hydrostatic pressure drove water inside. Now the best way to address this is to avoid it completely by not locating your floor framing below grade and ensuring that you have good drainage and flashing practices in place. However, there is a fix that we can use to address existing building conditions if the rim joist and sheathing hasn't rotted out yet, and it can also be used in new construction as well, though I'm not recommending it, but it essentially uses the same principles as any permanent wood foundation. We need a capillary break and a drainage space or an air gap between the slab or the ground and the wood framing, essentially uncoupling the walls from the damp surface beyond, and so we can actually use a dimple mat or a drainage membrane for this application to provide this needed uncoupling layer. Its function as a capillary break prevents moisture from wicking in from the concrete or the soils into the framing, but its secondary function as a drainage membrane also alleviates the buildup of any hydrostatic pressure, so if water was to collect around the intersection between these surfaces, it wouldn't be held in tension, and so we aren't compromising the flashing membrane or the WRB at this location. We want to make sure that we're sealing the connection between the concrete stem wall, the mud sill, and the sheathing or WRB with a continuous fluid applied flashing just to make sure that any water that leaks in won't make its way through this joint. If there's one thing I can emphasize here, it's that we need to be doing everything that we can to protect our moisture sensitive components from exposure to water now more than ever. We have to be very cautious about the way that we build if we want our homes and buildings to remain durable for generations. If this video was helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science content and head over to my website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics, the majority of which focus on preventing and addressing moisture issues in new and existing buildings. We also talk quite a bit about insulating and air sealing building assemblies for performance and longevity. Links to all of those will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.